Hello, everyone. Welcome to Be Waste Wise. I am Shweta Bandapani. I am the community builder at Be Waste Wise. Uh, in today's, the topic of today's webinar is reimagining sustainable agriculture through innovation and plastic waste. As some of you might already know what Be Waste Wise does, uh, but for those of you who don't know what Be Waste Wise does, we're a nonprofit organization. We're addressing the need for knowledge dissemination and waste management. Today's webinar is moderated by Daniela Russo. She's a CEO and co-founder of Think Beyond. She is going to talk to James Dubois, who's the Senior Manager of Environmental Sustainability at Driscoll's, and Rich Uto, who's the owner at Satsuma Farms. Some of you have already sent in your questions to us, and we pass them on to today's panelists. They will be weaving that into the conversation. But if you have questions when they're speaking, please feel free to use the Q&A section, and uh, Daniela will pick the questions up as and when they come up. So over to you, Daniela. Sweta, thank you so much. And uh, good morning and good evening to all of our participants, wherever you are. Uh, we're delighted to be here with you today. And uh, may I just first say many, many thanks to WasteWise for hosting this important conversation. WasteWise is a fantastic organization that provides a great community service uh, by fostering a place for dialogue around sustainability and plastic waste and waste in general. So uh, we strongly suggest you follow them and you follow their conversations. I myself have been a guest on, on their webinars multiple times. So thank you again for, for hosting this. Um, so um, a few words about Think Beyond for those of you who don't know us. Think Beyond advances innovation addressing the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we develop a pipeline of innovation. We accelerate it. We finance it uh, with the early stage and growth capital, and we build the innovation ecosystem around it. We've been doing this for the past 10 years, and uh, Think Beyond Plastic is probably our longest running program. And uh, Think Beyond Plastic is also uh, supported by Think Beyond Plastic Foundation, which we formed to develop our programs, as well as the specific initiatives related to plastics. Um, our goal really in what we do is to identify innovation that is specifically uh, capable of addressing these global environmental challenges. There is no shortage of accelerators and there is no shortage of innovations in universities and academic institutions, but there are very few organizations uh, like ours who actually identify innovation that has the potential of solving a big uh, sustainability problem. And the reason we're doing this is because we look at these sustainability challenges as innovation opportunities. To anybody whose DNA is from innovation, you realize that all of these problems could be solved in an economically feasible way. So we're looking into starting businesses. We're not looking into fostering research. We're looking into identifying research that has the potential to address these challenges. Big difference there. And uh, in that sense, there, um, there are organizations that we work with. We work with accelerators uh, around the world. Uh, we have partnerships globally. We also work with academic institutions and we work with industry, which is very important. Industry is one of the big participants in, uh, in uh, the global economy, obviously. And so when they have a specific requirement that is not met, that prevents them from addressing their sustainability goals, we're there to help and we work with them. So for that reason, we have uh, representatives from Driscoll's today, which is a major agricultural brand and representatives from their partners, the growers who uh, work with them to provide the, the in, in agriculture, the fruit and vegetable you can buy in your stores. So a few words about uh, what we're doing today. Recently, uh, Think Beyond Plastic Foundation, our plastics-focused uh, organization, announced the 2021 Ag Plastics Innovation Challenge. Um, agricultural uses of plastic are an important topic to us all, and a topic that is actually not as front and center as, for example, single-use and disposable packaging, beverages, uh, in, in snack packaging that creates the, the big issues with plastic that are so visible and we're also aware of. That said, um, about three years ago, 
uh, Think Beyond Plastic Foundation, uh, in partnership with the UN Environment, launched a project to understand the uses of plastic in agriculture. And this project was not prejudiced by any outcome. We just wanted to understand how it is used, uh, for what purpose, and if are there any downsides to using it and understand the upsides as well. And uh, part of it was we're motivated by, by our frequent travels around the world. Plastic in agriculture is used broadly. Um, in China, in Southeast Asia, it's used in Carmel Valley and in Carmel where uh, most of, many of us live. And uh, so it became an interesting topic for us to discover. And so what we discovered is, you know, it, just as in every other aspect of our lives, since it was commercialized in the middle of the 50s broadly, plastic is widely used in, in agriculture. It's become ubiquitous and deeply embedded in, in agricultural food production. And it's been able to provide to growers around the world and to industry a unique combination of performance characteristics at a relatively low financial cost. And, and I think Rich can talk about this more and, and James as well. What we learned, which to me was a great discovery, and forgive me if you already know this, but plastic is one reason that agriculture has been able to increase productivity without increasing acreage. It extends the growing season, it improves yields and quality, and it reduces spoilage in the field. So it's very beneficial. It's, it's very cheap compared to alternatives and disposal has not been easy, but it's not been all that difficult either. So. Uh, we'll learn that farmers bury it, pay to have it hauled away if they can afford it, or just, you know, find other ways to deal with field plastic until there co comes a point where this is very difficult to do. And I think we're at this point right now. Um, plastic in the fields is used widely. Uh, like I said, it's it's very beneficial. It's a good thing, but it creates all sorts of problems that uh, James Dubois from Driscoll, Driscoll is going to talk to us about, and and challenges with collections. Not the least of it, the fact that it comes in touch with the soil, and when it comes in touch with the soil, then it's very difficult to collect, clean, and and recycle. So. Another area that we've begun to think about, and very little is known about it yet, is what happens to the plastic film when it's exposed to sun rays and when it sits on top of the soil. Could it possibly break down into small microparticles, just like it does in the ocean? And preliminary research says that this is very likely and very possible. No studies have been done yet to tell us what that will do to the microbial life in the soil. But what we do know from our research of plastic in the ocean is that these small particles can, can be, become highly uh, condensed carriers of the toxic material that is in the plastic. So because of this, it's potentially harmful to the microbial life in the soil. As I said, uh, this is something for us to think about and some, some more studies are necessary, but these are the initial factors that caused us to start looking into plastic film in particular. And um, the, the purpose of this innovation challenge is to find ways to deal with waste in the fields from plastic film. And there are many ways to deal with this. You can create a new material that has improved recyclability. You can come up with industry uh, or community initiatives that increase, again, collection and provide economic incentives. Or, you know, you can have a new design for plastic mulching. So this is why we asked an open-ended question in our innovation challenge. Uh, what can be done? Tell us what your solutions are. The upside of this challenge is that it's supported by Driscoll as a lead partner in, in partnership with many other industry uh, sponsors. Um, California Giant is one of them, but there are a number of others. So uh, we've they, the, the industry partners have offered that uh, they will uh, look into winning innovation uh, innovations and work with uh, some of the winners to uh, pilot their innovations on their farms. So the bottom line here is uh, the need is there. Industry is interested in finding solutions and it's up to you innovators to help us do this. So without, without further ado, let me turn over to first Jim Dubois from Driscoll 
and then Rich Utel from Satsuma Farms, who is uh, one of the growers delivering product to California Giant. And let's talk a little bit about why you participate in this challenge. Uh, what is the, how do you see the challenge from your perspective? And um, then we'll have a conversation around these topics. So James, uh, can you, let's start with you. Great. Thanks, Danielle. And thank you, Suida, for, uh, for organizing uh, this event. And uh, wanted to also thank our, our partners in the industry. Um, you know, really, we're competitors, but we are, um, um, but we are uh, participating and collaborating together to find a solution for, for what is a, you know, a widely known to be an industry um, concern. Um, so my name is James Dubois, uh, environmental lead at Driscoll's. We're a fresh berry marketer. Um, we have um, operations globally. Um, my focus area is within uh, the Americas. Uh, and um, uh, we, um, my, the, the environmental focus areas that we have are water stewardship, um, which is our longest standing uh, commitment to our environmental work. And we have a new area of focus, uh, which is um, field plastics. So um, we, we do, uh, we also have a focus area on our consumer facing plastics um, and alternatives to pl plastic clamshells are being developed in Europe. We're working on increasing recyclability and recycled content in the US. So while we're proud of the work we're doing on packaging, the, the focus of uh, for today and really uh, of my work in plastics is on uh, the area of field plastics. Which again is, is quite new for us. Really, we have probably less than two years uh, with, with the focused efforts here. Um, so, um, as we've expanded in existing and um, in, into new uh, growing areas, um, the volume of plastics that we generate and the destination of those plastics and, and the impacts that, that those plastics generate um, ha have become concerning. Um, and so, what are those impacts? And we have, we have litter, we have visual impacts. Um, um, plastic can um, can enter um, the, you know the regional communities and ecosystems, um, and we have operational issues associated with the disposal of those field plastics. And um, just to, to kind of set um, some background here, the types of field plastics that we use are for high tunnels, so the sort of temporary greenhouse structures that we use to grow berries, and we really use those across all of the berry types: blueberries, blackberries, strawberries, um, and raspberries. Uh, we also use um, plastics in, um, in drip irrigation. So the drip tubing that, that you see in our fields, sometimes buried, sometimes on top of the bed is, is made out of plastic. Um, we use plastic mulch, which primarily we use in strawberries. So it's a bed covering, the strawberry bed covering, which has uh, many agronomic and fruit quality advantages. So when I refer to field plastics, those are the main types of plastics that I'm referring to. There are some others as well. Um, so uh, many sustainability initiatives, both within Driscoll's and in other companies, originate from the consumer or the or the customer. Um, and while I have no doubt that that these are the field plastics and the impacts they generate are of concern to the consumer and to our customer, this really originated originated from a recognition of uh, and a concern for the impacts of our field plastics and waste stream it creates in the communities in which we operate. Um, so that's in California and Florida, the Pacific Northwest, Mexico, where we operate in the central regions, uh, high elevation regions of Jalisco and Michoacan, or in, um, in Baja California as well, in the San Quentin region. Um, and so of all those plastics, um, the ones that we're most focused on um, on developing solutions for and, and looking for solutions for and hoping that you know, those listening and, and others in, in uh, uh, it can it are developing solutions for soil contact plastics. So we are able to recycle the, the high tunnel plastics that I mentioned, as well as the drip tape. It's not easy, but we do have some solutions for that. Um, we, of course, are looking for better solutions all the time. Where we are really lacking a solution is for end of life, you know, just end of life disposal and recycling for soil contact plastics. So those bed mulches, uh, weed mat or ground cover, which we use in some of our crops as well. Um, so, and the reason that the, the disposal of these materials is difficult is because they have contact with soil. So they, they pick up uh, soil particles, they pick up moisture, um, and um, the recycling, the recycling of, these, of these materials is often difficult. Um, in areas where we do have solutions, the solutions aren't consistent. It'll vary from year to year on what a recycler will take, for example. Um, 
So um, the, the sort of solution domains that we're looking at, um, and there may be more, but this is kind of how we see it now, are um, there is reuse. Um, so are there, are there uses, are there technologies, are there different types of film or applications that can increase the life uh, within the, uh, the life of that film within the context of how we use that plastic? So, um, you know, can we find films that um, have a longer life but aren't necessarily heavier or more difficult to manage? Or more, you know, significantly more expensive, and then of course recycling, which is where we see most of the solutions now, um, and that's both from a chemical, uh, you know, conversion from plastic to fuel, and a mechanical um, a recycling perspective. And so we we see in both of both mechanical and chemical recycling that cleaning and handling are really important aspects, right? Without um, proper handling, uh, without proper retrieval handling, logistics, and cleaning. Recycling is, is extremely difficult. So um, those are sort of the, the two main um, uh, solution domains that we see. The other is substitution, um, which we are maybe a little bit less, we see kind of um, less of currently, but um, no doubt in the future there will be more. You know, are there other materials that we can use, um, either different types of plastic or sub plastic substitutions that are a, of a lower impact? Um, so that's a, that's a general kind of overview of, of the the the, um, of the impacts that we see and the, the solution space that we can see. Uh, we know that others can bring potentially different uh, perspectives to that. And um, yeah, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. Again, thank you to, to Danielle and Sweet for organizing this, and, and thank you to um, to our collaborators on the uh, Think Beyond Plastics Challenge. Well, thank you, James. And uh, I just wanted to um, make a couple of points to what you said. Uh, you do grow in many geographies outside of North America. Uh, the, the, the other piece that I wanted to add to this puzzle is in conversations with our colleagues in China and specifically those who work on innovation, uh, we discovered that uh, plastic mulching is becoming a big challenge there too. And it's used on a massive scale. and. Uh, now, because they've used it for so long on, and on such a scale, uh, for all the good it's done, it is beginning to cause a huge environmental problem. So it is a global issue. And uh, we truly appreciate your leadership in, in helping kind of formulate the questions in the search for solutions. What can be done, uh, whether it's a substitution or, or a, uh, improved recyclability, what can be done to change the design so that, um, you know, these things are possible. And um, the, the other thing I wanted to ask you to think about after when we begin to, the conversation about the innovators is one of the big challenges that innovators have, especially in, in this space, is um, feedback from industry. How do they get guidance from you on what is uh, required and what is not? and what would be useful and what is not as a solution. We have a few questions here that I think uh, we can ask you to answer live after we hear from Rich as well. But please think about um, what, um, and, and you can talk a little bit about the pilots that we discussed and you know that the, the fact that Driscoll's is actually actively involved in reviewing these innovations. Uh, let's talk a little bit how Driscoll's is embracing this entire innovation challenge uh, actively and willing to, to be participant in the solution. So I think that will be useful. Um, but let's, let's do this um, after we hear from Rich. And Rich, without further ado, let's hear from the farmer. Uh, tell us about your challenges with plastic and why you do what you do uh, with regards to reducing plastic waste. But please so, tell yeah, us first yeah. what you do. I, I love your story and uh, your background. So uh, started growing strawberries. I think it's been 14 years now, but I kind of started late in my, my life, I guess you want to say that, but um, I don't know, for some reason with plastic, it's, a, it's extremely big concern and, and, you know, like kind of jumping around, but last year when I took, because my, my plastic, my egg plastic, the mulch, um, it goes to the landfill and I knew at some point, like, this is crazy because what I put in plastic wise, and then the weight that went to the landfill was, you know, almost double because of, you know, like the contamination from the soil and 
and you know just moisture or whatever it is but it just I, I, it just amazed me and what was going on um you know as far as like the drip tape we're doing that we're recycling that they just picked it up yesterday what i had you know what i did for last year 165 acres they basically picked up all the drip tape and also the oval that goes along with it but they didn't take the lay flat because the lay flat has coloring in it uh, lay flats a, a different type of you know way to transmit water um, it's made out of the same material but the problem is that it's different colors blue green so they can't take it that's fine i i, I have to Basically, that has to go to one place, and that's the landfill. If I do do that, most of the stuff I recycle it, I reuse it, do as much as I can, and reuse everything that we have here. Um, as far as the, uh, you know, the the, the irrigation system. Um, but anyways, yeah. So I've been doing this for 15 years, and I don't know, just um, you know, I I kind of live it, I guess, as a grower. Because I'm the one putting the plastic in. I'm the one that's, you know, putting in the uh, the drip tape. You know, um, with help, you know, I, I we're trying some biodegradable mulch. You know, and and uh, you know, it's just it's a trial process right now. I hope in some time in 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 my future that you know something's going to come out of this. But um, I'm just here to support. I'm trying to be as transparent as possible because as far as as far as the way it is, I mean, it's it's pretty difficult. And like James said, it's about if there's a way to clean the plastic, that would probably be the only way that's ever, you know, be feasible. Um, but uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. I don't really, you know, I just live it. I guess put put it that way. I kind of the boots on the ground and kind of deal with the everyday process of of growing strawberries. That's what I do, and yeah, and uh, and you know, Cal Giant's been really supportive of everything that uh, I'm trying to accomplish out here. Well, Rich, you know. can you um, can you give us a little bit of background uh, about Satsuma Farms, how big they are, and what you so, grow, and what your relationship is with California Giant, so people understand. So, I'm a I'm a grower for California Giant. I I grow 140 acres. Going into 2022, I put 140 acres of uh, conventional in and 20 acres of organic. And, you know, all my berries go straight to California Giant. And it's like a partnership. Um, and, you know, like this past year, I just, I did the same thing. I had 140 acres of conventional and 20 acres of organic. And so it's just a rotation. Um, so that's, it's a, it's a, it, you know what, it's, it's, I was talking about earlier about the seasons have now gotten there's no there's no rest time in between this because because everything that we have to do with the environment um, with social accountability uh, everything so it, it's a it's a it's almost a you might have a little break during Christmas or you know maybe first part of the year because of rain but other than that it's it's a kind of a full year thing now uh, as far as this goes. So, yeah. but yeah, that's kind of where I'm at with it. I'm just, like I said, I'm just a grower that, you know, has has concerns about that too. And I'm pretty sure um, everybody does too. And everybody should in reality. And, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, plastic is now used in almost every stage of the uh, agricultural life cycle. That, that is what we've learned. It's pre-planting may in include fumigation film and nursery pots um, and, and seedling trays, right? That's all plastic. And oftentimes it's uh, uh, disposable. And then there is the irrigation system, the drip tape, the channel liners to drainage oh. pipes. I think that James talked a little bit about this. So um, this all is now plastic and I'm sure you, you, you see it. Um, you know, rubber has been replaced just like in medical uses. <laughs> You with yeah. with single use and disposable plastic. It's all plastic. It's it's all plastic. You know, it's it's all plastic. It's you know, it's the way. You know, economically, that's that's what we have to think about too. Yeah. If, if yeah. We can't yeah. make money. Then I don't know why we're. I mean, I, I would love the growth, but you need to be financially kind of, 
you know, keep it going. So plastic is a big part of it. Yeah, yeah. If there's other well, alternatives as far as economics is, yeah, economics is really an important part of the equation for all of this. No, no doubt. Yeah. So um, there is a question here, and I don't know if it's too technical, <clears throat> so we can jump into some uh, conversation with the mm -hmm. with the audience. But um, uh, people are asking, what is the definition and description of the plastics used? Color, substance, film thickness, width, and length. Is that something that it gets like too detailed to answer right now, or do you know it? Oh, no, you know. So my 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 beds are 48 to 48 inch centers, and so I use a 66 inch mulch. It's a it's it's a mill and a half. So it's it's you need something thick that you know like if you're going to because we put it on with the with the tractor with the mulch machine and, and it really stretches it out. So you need something that's going to have a little bit of you know a little bit of give, but also not you know kind of um, put it this way. It's not going to if it wears and tears during the season, then you know you're going to have so many issues to deal with. And it also yeah. it, it, it's it just. Yeah, that's what I go with. I go 60 inch, 60 inch, inch mulch green. Um, and yeah, that's what I do. A meal and a half. That's what I use. Yeah, yeah. You know, some growers that have bigger beds go with bigger plastic. Yeah. So. Um, and and James, yeah, uh, do you want to? Down. Yeah, do you want to jump in here? And feel sure. free to jump in. Don't, um, you know, to add to whatever Rich says. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good question, and and really, it varies significantly. Um, it, what we see within, you know, our our growers, our independent growers operations is, it varies by geography, by region, by growing district, and so, um, um, you know, both in terms of the the width of a plastic roll, the thickness of the plastic used, the types of plastic used, I mean, the growing systems vary as well. So. It's really a regional question in terms of how much is generated and what types and what thicknesses of films. And so there is there is too much detail for us to go through all of that now, but I think that is information that through this platform we can make available, you know, to individuals as, as you know, if, if, uh, as that's appropriate. So, um, but a, a couple of general thoughts, um, you know, it's generally high density and low density polyethylene um, in the actual films, the, the, the tunnel, the high tunnel plastic and the mulch plastic. There is some polypropylene films as well that are used in both um, the you know, uh, irrigation water delivery systems as well as in some of the soil contact, you know, ground cover um, and kind of woven mulch films. Um, or I should say woven mulches um, and in some of the pots that we use as well. So it is the, the, the resins are variable and the characteristics and specs are variable, but um, for the most part, uh, you know, again, we're focused on those soil contact plastics, and most of those are HDPE, high density, and LDPE, low density polyethylene films. Sounds great, thank you. And uh, if there are some more specific uh, parameters that can be made public, we can share them uh, through our um, Innovation Challenge platform. And, um, and, and there are a few questions here that kind of touch on some of the business aspects of the use of uh, plastic. So I, I wanted to uh, ask those. One of them is, are there financial incentives in place for ag industry to recycle one or to use substitutes? So similar to the incentives for organic fertilization. Can you speak to that? I, I can take a, a first shot at it if, if you like. Um, I mean, I, I think the incentive is, well, let's refer to it like this. There is an <laughs> there is a cost to the current disposal of plastics, and so where available, uh, you know, those plastics go into landfills, and that, uh, you know, landfills are heavily impacted, especially in California. So um, those costs are increasing rapidly, and I, I, I'm sure Rich can give some specifics on that. So that's that's um, the incentive is to really move away from that and to create some you know, either cost neutral or cost positive um, alternative to, you know, that, that is, you know, our, our only disposal option. Um, and uh, again, th those costs are only increasing the, um, and, and the requirements and restrictions associated with, with that disposal route are, um, you know, only becoming more challenging. Um, 
So, but in terms of a, a label or a certification, to my knowledge, that, that doesn't exist in our, in our space. Um, but um, yeah, I, I would say that um, even kind of separate from the economic incentive, you know, our growers feel a responsibility to do this in virtually every region in which we operate. Um, you know, they have to look at these plastics piling up in a yard where there is no um, disposal, uh, you know, end of life disposal um, available to them. So um, I think even aside from the economic incentives, kind of the just the, the sense of responsibility is there in virtually every region I operate in. All, all of our growers are concerned about this and collaborating with us. You know, and we'll collaborate on on the development and piloting of new technology as well. So we have a really um, eager, you know, a group of hundreds of people that are that are interested in solving this problem. Rich, I think. Jake... Yeah, so I think James hit anything on point. I mean, so like me, I'm just I'm the grower. I'm the one kind of little small piece in this puzzle here, but everybody needs to kind of be, as James used the word, eager to find a solution on this one. There is no economic, there's no financial, there's really, we just take it to the landfill, I pay the bill and that kind of goes. I mean, we have to, I, I do that with the drip tape, not worried about it, but the biggest, the biggest egg plastic issue is going to be the mulch. And you go to landfill, I mean, I don't know what the timeline here in Monarch County is at the Marina landfill, but I'm pretty sure it's kind of the way there's more plastic going in the ground as we speak, and there's more acres of berries out there, there's just going to be more plastic. And if they don't, if there's no solution, then it's going to be kind of crazy. So, you know, I, I went back to the part about like, you know, like in certain places, they clean the plastic, but again, all the residual. So how do you clean the plastic? Well, you got to clean it. You know, I don't know. There's only one way to clean it, and that's with water. Um, but I mean, it's got to be, you know, kind of instead of to do something like that, where, you know, like like James says, I'm not worried. About, I'm not trying to. Um, for me, it's not about. It's like it's going to cost money no matter what, as far as the grower goes. Even if we take it to landfill, but this do something where it's a little bit more positive. If we're going to spend that money taking the landfill, I mean, it's, I think there's got to be some kind of alternative. But again, that might be a little cost on the growers' part. Maybe growers are going to say, Rich, be quiet. But in reality, that's our responsibility. Yeah. You know, I, I really believe that. That's got to be part of your, your budget going into the season. Like, okay, how are we going to get rid of this? How are we going to make sure that we got some, you know, clean plastic? Because, you know what, it's, it's basically, all the residual on the plastic is it, it sticks there. It, it I mean, it's it's, it's, it's kind of contaminated, so it's the way it is. So I, but I think that if there's some form of incentive, it would be more of incentive like being positive for the environment kind of thing. Yeah. And that's I'm 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 good with that. But yeah, no matter what, I got to take it somewhere. Yeah. I I, I don't want to take it to the landfill, but I have no choice to take it to the landfill. I can leave you sitting on my property at, or you know on the ranch and then just let it go, but I'll stockpile it here. But if there's no incentive as far as finding a way, because we pay money in that way. Maybe, maybe they might have maybe the facilities, the landfills might have a facility where they can do that. Cause I know right now, and I just found this out yesterday, that my mulch that gets picked up goes to the landfill and they they bulk it up, they they compress and they make it in these things so to make it easily easier to, to ship, you know. But also the drip tape has, is contaminated too. It's got all the soil on it and moisture in it. So they, but they, I think they squeeze everything out of that thing. But anyways, that's so, kind of what. So Rich, of, yeah, yeah a, a, a question for you, uh, really quickly, and I think you touched upon it. Um, if if uh, the, the plastics are pressure cleaned or soaked. The, the only barrier to this is additional cost. Is that right? Or is it possible that they be soaked and pressure cleaned? Yeah, I mean, that I wouldn't be able to do it. It would have to, so like, let's say, yeah. it would have to be a facility where you take the, take it somewhere to a facility. That's additional then, cost. Also, you know, you got that water that, you, whatever you cleaned it, whatever cleans something, now you got all the, you know, you got, 
the soil on it, you, you know, yeah. whatever it may be. And then, you know, then you got whatever you use to clean it, that's, I wouldn't say contaminated, but it's kind of part of that. You know what I mean? So well, what are you going to do with that? Like, yeah. So it says catching that and then recycling that. It's, it's yeah. like a, it's like a, it's just kind of, it's a recycling process all the way through the line. I mean, yeah, yeah. Because James hit it early on about like you think about like how long is plastic sticking around? It sticks around for a long time. It never breaks down. It's, it just gets smaller and smaller. And I think, you know, they're, they're at some point, um, you know, have to think about that. You know, you, you someone brought it up, or well, I think you did about um, how is the plastic affecting the microbials in the soil? You know, right now I'm all about, you know, healthy soils initiatives, you know, trying to make, you know, try to be a good steward of, of what I farm because, you know, it's like, you know, and that's, I guess it fits the whole gamut of what hopefully in my lifetime, I can kind of, you know, get to that point of uh, all that stuff to put back in to what we actually, you know, taken out. I don't, I'm not saying that, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're doing our due diligence to not abuse what we have, you know what I mean? But, um, you know, especially in California, it's pretty tough to farm. <laughs> it's the way it is. Yeah. But I think well, that's what uh, I'm thinking, but there's, if there was a, uh, if there was something that we can do, if we already pay to go take it to the dump, to the landfill, then maybe there might be another alternative um, in some way. And then someone, you know, someone that's smarter and that's why you got all these innovators out there that can do something with the plastic and then i know that they got the bio you know they got the plastic fuel thing going on and everybody's kind of into that that'd be awesome i mean just something you know yeah uh, but you know that's that's all it is because i'm just i'm just like i had the raw material yeah raw ugly material and i gotta do something with it so you tell me where to go and you guys, there's smarter people out there than me, then just, just do it. I'm all for and, that. Yeah, and I do it you, anyway, know, so. you heard it. This is this is a word to the innovators. Uh, there is an opportunity uh, and an interest in a new material. And actually, in the last uh, few years, we've had uh, at least two companies who developed an alternative to field plastics uh, from uh, lignin, some of them, from agricultural waste. What we discovered is there are challenges with um, uh, its longevity and uh, its capacity to withstand to moisture, but there is definitely an effort underway. And so, um, you know, there is one question here: this, are there any biodegradable alternatives uh, like cornstarch? And uh, and I'm curious um, if you and James, you too, have seen some of these alternatives and what have been the challenges, because I know they're out there and I know that you have been approached to test. Uh, yeah. What did you see that doesn't work or what would you like to see? That would be great. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I, can, I can make a few comments on that. Um, so uh, in terms of you know substitutions, I mean, I think you hit it on the head. One of the main challenges is longevity. Um, but I, I think something that we haven't mentioned yet is really understanding the trade-offs associated with alternatives as well. We, you know, we want to make sure that we don't go and switch into something that has other impacts yeah. Um, foreseen impacts such as, you know, maybe carbon footprint impacts or eutrophication impacts. So we want to really, um, you know, in the substitution space, we want to make sure that, you know, the, the, an alternative isn't actually, you know, just kind of shifting the impact to, you know, some other domain or some other region or um, so. So that's really important to us. We do see, uh, you know, substitutions are probably further out. I mean, and I'd love for if somebody you know has something that's closer in, great. But because of that longevity, so um, you know our the plastic properties or the let's call them the film properties in our applications, those properties need to last through the whole season. So if if that that plastic breaks down, our beds will slump, our berries will sit on bare soil. Um, there could be yield, um, you know, mechanization. If we can't get a tractor through, is a bed slumping down? That's a problem. We could have quality impacts. Um, so yeah, I mean, when used as a plastic mulch, for example, those beds, that bed structure needs to to remain intact um, throughout that whole season. So it's um, I think that's a big challenge in the substitution space is kind of timing the decomposition of a plastic, um, you know, to synchronize with our needs. 
Um, I, I did want to add, Rich brought up a great point on kind of handling and the touch points on retrieving plastic. And I, I thought it might be helpful to clarify a couple of things for the, um, for the audience. You know, the touch points of these soil contact films and the opportunities are really in the retrieval stage. So you, you've gone through the season, you have a film in the field, and there's a retrieval process. And so in, in many cases, growers will uh, retrieve plastic with their own crews, their own labor crews. Um, and, you know, there is retrieval equipment that has been developed that's making that more efficient and in some cases is helping to clean the plastic in that process. Um, there are also um, um, services for retrieval as well, um, and, and that is sort of regionally dependent. It exists in Watsonville and Salinas, for example, um, maybe other areas in California. So, so those are sort of the, the, the initial touch points, right? The grower or the retrieval service taking that film out of the field, separating it from the drip tape, which is really important. Um, or, you know, we have to do that now because the drip tape often has a, um, you know, a potential recycling um, end of life solution, whereas the mulch film often doesn't. So it has to be separated. So that's sort of the the first touch point, the first opportunity for cleaning is in that, that, that retrieval. Um, in some areas, that plastic is taken to a collection center um, and maybe you know, a large grower or a community of growers will develop a collection center where that plastic can be taken, potentially further cleaned, but often compacted and kind of bailed into something that can be easily, more easily transported. Um, in the event that there is a, a recycling solution. Um, so it, it allows you to more efficiently take plastics from say a more remote area to a, a recycler. So, you know, again, in the event that you have a recycler um, available for that plastic. So that's kind of the general flow of, of the plastic from the field, you know, to, to the recycler when recycling is available. So those are the opportunities for cleaning, for better handling, for better logistics, which, which are all yeah. really a solution domain. Um, for, for this is very helpful, uh, and um, and I it's very helpful. And I actually wanted to um, ask a question here from the audience. Uh, three people asked it independently in a different way, and it has to do with extended producer responsibility. So, are there any um, requirements for extended producer responsibility for farmers and and for your farmers, uh, James, and uh, for farmers like you, Rich? Uh, what the requirements are, and would there be a policy initiative that actually might help with uh, the collection with regards to plastic mulch? Okay. What is extended producer? Can you explain that to me? Oh, extended producer responsibility is essentially when the producers are made responsible for uh, the materials that they put out in the marketplace in okay. for the end of life. So, uh, for example, recycling for bottles is an example of extended producer responsibility when it's subsidized by the manufacturer. And uh, what we don't know is whether something like this exists in the agricultural space. Sometimes it's a policy initiative that uh, could be useful. Uh, sometimes it's like uh, more of a stick than a carrot, but we're just people are just curious if that exists in your space. Yeah, I, I would say um, I don't know of it existing in our space in terms of uh, films, you know, drip tapes, you know, the, the field plastics that we're using. I, I don't believe it does. Um, and I know that this is something that's common with bubbles, like you said, and also with um, yeah. ET with, you know, bottles, essentially soda bottles and water bottles. Um, you know, I, I don't think that I'm, I'm qualified to, to sort of predict, you know, what the policy outcomes would be. Um, but I do think that, um, and I am seeing increased engagement on this topic from um, from the film manufacturers and and you know the distributors, um, and we are seeking to you know increase their engagement. Um, I'm sure there's probably a few in the audience today. Um, we yeah we are seeing and we are seeing some innovation you know and some investment. Um, I, I can't really speak to specifics here, but. Um, um, but yeah, it, so it's something that we would, we see some more engagement from the manufacturers. We'd like to see more. We'd like to see, uh, we'd like to partner with them more on this. Um, whether that is something that is brought about by a policy change, um, you know, I, I don't know if that's sort of what, what kind of impacts that would have, but I think the general point of bringing them into this fold is, is, is important. Um, I think they need to be involved. And I think as you get into kind of closed loop recycling, it becomes even more important. You know, we 
we'd like to know, you know, we want to increase the recycling rates um, that in our in our uh, supply chain currently, um, and eventually we'd like to know, you know, where does that end up, or could we reincorporate that um, those recycled plastics into, you know, in back into the field in some way? We right. we can't take tunnel film and convert it into tunnel film, but um, could that be used in you know pots or seedling trays or drip right. tape? Um, and there is some good work happening there. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, and so, so yeah, again, I, I wanna make sure that I'm clarifying there, there is engagement from manufacturers um, now, and, but I do think we can benefit from more. Yeah, that really was kind of the question because oftentimes in talking with plastic manufacturers about alternative materials, their answer is there is no demand. Uh, our customers have not requ requested it. So, is is that you know are you placing these uh, requests to your suppliers do they know that you're looking for this it's sort of where the questions are going yeah and i think something i left out that i'd like to add quickly is that it it we it's a you know kind of chicken or the egg scenario is do you need to have the recycling or the end of life solutions in place before that type of engagement can you know produce the outcome you want or or do those requirements need to be in place to create the market landscape for those innovations to occur? I, I yeah, I, that's a question that, that I think about pretty consistently. And so I, I do think, you know, we, we, we think there's a lot that's possible, a lot more engagement and collaboration with the manufacturers, with our growers, um, you know, when, once we have more kind of defined and more really um, sustainable, but by sustainable, I mean, uh, longer term, you know, we we see a lot of people come into the recycling space, and you know, we'll try the mulch films, um, soil contact films, and um, you know, we'll take some, and then really the next year they can't, right? So we we need yeah. that kind of sustained innovation, sustained presence, sustained collaboration, um, yeah, in order to make this work as well. Well, and in you know, uh, manufacturers are notoriously slow to respond to changes in their product cycles or in you know their portfolio which is where innovators come in so like i said we have seen alternative materials um one of the companies we worked with uh, went all the way to the growers to ask them what the costs are the what what rich was talking about what is the full cost of using this material uh, the the from the you know the purchasing cost or the cost of removal and then mm -hmm. part of that they incorporated that in the cost of their new material uh, so that definitely is uh, going to be an opportunity for disruption and innovation no doubt about that um, and then um, James can you say a few words about uh, how Driscoll is going to work with innovators assuming we find something that uh, is of great interest to you, um, you know, you, we talked a little bit about the pilot and the support that would be really important. Perhaps you can say that. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess it, it really depends on, on kind of what what the innovation or what the concept is. But um, um, yeah, I mean, we operate in, you know, many areas. Um, and so there's the advantage of that is that we have kind of multiple seasons and cycles happening. So um, you know, California has a certain cycle and, you know, that starts and stops on certain dates and we have a totally different cycle in, in Mexico in many ways. So there's opportunities to kind of key into that cycle. And by that, I mean, if it's a, um, if it's a retrieval process, we have some farm somewhere in North America that is retrieving plastic, for example, on virtually any month of the year. So, um, so we, yeah, we feel like we can accommodate um, again, depending on what type of technology it is. If it's a substitute film, then then it you know we have um, somebody laying mulch somewhere in within the the, the you know the, the the Driscoll realm somewhere. Um, so um, so I think we we have a lot of flexibility there. Um, and you know we we also I mean so I think from a you know personal basis and me and and colleagues and and our grower and you know many growers that are highly knowledgeable of this of this um of this area um you know we know what works what doesn't i think we can also provide you know some pretty good feedback we've tried so many things we've contacted so many recyclers um we've looked at so many other end of life disposals. so so i think we can 
you know, um, I think we can provide value in terms of, yeah, um, ease of, you know, good platform for trialing or for trying and, and trying to apply a concept. We can provide good feedback. Um, you know, we have, like I said, we have many eager growers that are looking to collaborate with us on this and, and develop a solution. So there's, you know, multiple uh, locations, uh, you know, to, to host um, a pilot, for example, if we do, if we're able to identify something that has, um, you know, that kind of checks the boxes. So. And to innovators who are uh, listening, part of our audience, I want to uh, say a little bit more uh, to that point. We have learned from working with the innovator community on these tough tech innovations for the last 10 years, that uh, that kind of support is essential. Uh, industry support is essential and mentorship as well as early um, non-dilutive capital, as well as scale up services. So Think Beyond works in that realm and uh, the successful pilots will ultimately proceed to uh, receive scale up services at the Global Entrepreneurship uh, Forum that uh, we helped co-found. So uh, we, we realize the need for support and these are not easy innovations. These are innovations that take time, that take, uh, um, kind of a guided mentorship and that will be provided. So we're, we're looking forward to having your ideas and uh, your uh, innovations to, to be shared with us. Um, there was a question that came up for you, Rich, and um, I'd love to answer ask you, which is uh, strawberries used to be grown on straw mulch. Have you tried traditional agricultural practices? And what are your thoughts on that? I think the reason why we haven't done that is because it's also a food safety issue now. I mean, anything that touches soil, I mean, that's the biggest thing now. So it's 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 that contamination from soil to actual fruit that's because it's all low hanging fruit. And that's one of the big reasons why I think, you know, uh, when I started, it just they had mulch out there. Um, but I got a I got a question too, is like, you know, like so if if the plastic is clean. Is there, I mean, what, what, what would do with that, that clean plastic or recycled plastic? Uh, is there, I mean, that's why there's innovators out there, but see, I don't know if it's a, I don't know if it's like someone, because no one's going to do it for not making any money. Yeah. These recyclers are not going to do it. So yeah. if there's got to be some incentive, I mean, so that it's the financial incentive, why would you do it? Why would anybody do anything? Because that's just the world that we live in now. If there's no economic plus side to it, so you got all these, you got all these big capital investors. You got, you know, thing, and so what? What would they do with that plastic if they were gonna? Because there's there's a lot of plastic out there. I don't know. There's I think there's an extra fifteen hundred acres here in California this year. That's yeah. fifteen hundred acres of more plastic. Yeah, it's kind of curious where. You know what what what's going to be done if you do clean it and, and where's that that financial part for whoever wants to do it well plastic recycling is a business right so uh the ones who will collect it and do something with it need to have an economic incentive exactly. and at the place where you know oil is very very cheap there is no economic incentive because it's cheaper to produce you know, use virgin material than collect it and recycle it at a time when oil becomes to be a, a more expensive commodity, then you know there is an economic incentive to reuse. So it's just the usual waxing and waning, but we're drowning in plastic right now um, yeah. on the planet. And yeah. um, yeah. you know, collection is not all that easy uh, in every geography. There are no economic incentives for a lot. I know that ag plastic does have some economic incentives. They, they exist. Um, and I, I hear the audience when they say financial incentive must come from extended producer responsibility. Uh, mm -hmm. I hear you. And it's, uh, it's definitely one of the angles. But um, you're right. You know, if there is no one to collect it and figure out what to do with it, then, you know, it, the fact that it's recyclable doesn't do us a whole lot of good. Yeah, so, well, I, that's kind of where I'm going with this, like, you know, James talks about end of life, but, you know, even if you clean it, is, is there end of life after that on this egg plastic, on the, especially the mulch, you know, is what I'm talking about. 
because that's the biggest burden right now for us in egg plastic. And if you go to yeah. landfill, it's, it's basically mulch. And, you know, and I just found this out recently. I thought everybody separated mulch and their drip tape. And I found out. They don't. The <laughs> I'm like, what? I mean, that's, that, that's, that should be a, a no brainer. But I guess they don't do that because it doesn't, it costs more money to do that. It's because I noticed that too. I was like, how is that guy getting done so easily, so fast, pulling out their mulch? I, I couldn't figure out why <laughs> pulling out the mulch and dripping. Well, they're mixing it together. And this whole time and all my years of farming, I thought everybody was separating out anyways. And I, I didn't know that. So, oh, so, oh, Danielle left. Yeah, it, it seems like Daniela has dropped off while I try to find out where she is at. Uh, do you or uh, James want to have a look at some of the questions in the Q&A and uh, maybe pick those up? Sure, I can take a look. Yeah, yeah. And uh, to the audience, if you have any specific questions for James or Rich, please uh, drop them in the Q&A. We have another four minutes. And uh, we'll quickly be moving towards wrap up. I'll just try to find Daniela in the meantime. Yeah, I'll, I'll actually add on to the points that were made about the economics of um, of recyclability. I mean, we we are seeing you know higher um, oil and fuel prices right now, and um, but what we're not seeing is sort of the, you know that doesn't really uniformly apply to all the types of plastic we're trying to recycle. Um, you know, all of a sudden, you know, the recyclers are are hungrier for um, drip tape. What, maybe more specifically, high tunnel plastic, but we're we're still not seeing, you know, it's not the the value of the recycled mulch material, you know, after retrieval, after after cleaning, after compaction and transport, it, it's still not at a point where you know pe people aren't knocking on our doors to come and take mulch. So um, I don't know. There's obviously some price point at which um, mulch, even with its soil and water weight added and, and difficulty in cleaning and, and you know removing those those compounds is um, it, we don't know at which point that you know what that threshold is for it to be um, you know uh, attractive for a recycler to take. And so I think the whole point is you know on the recycling kind of this recycling part of the solution domain is that 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 cleaning is really really important and and the extent possible that cleaning happen as early as possible in the handling of that plastic so you know if it happens kind of on the third turn then you know you've then you've essentially moved soil and water weight around um so uh, anyways i just urge anybody that's interested or or engaged in or has an idea that that's within that solution space that cleaning whether it's for recycled uh, mechanical recycling, or um, you know, we've we've worked with multiple um, uh, plastic to fuel conversion um, folks, you know, that are engaged in the development of that technology, and and cleaning is also important there. So it's it's not just mechanical recycling; it's also chemical chemical recycling. Well, I, I uh, this was this was a really interesting conversation, and. Uh, you actually touched upon uh, one of the questions that came at the very end about plastic to fuel technologies. So we only have two minutes uh, left and I just wanted to wrap up the Q&A because there are a lot of questions and I know some of them we couldn't answer, but uh, this conversation is just starting. And I just wanted to give uh, each of our uh, panelists the opportunity to say one last thing to the audience. We have two minutes, so each of you has a minute to say uh, in, in, in departure, what, what would you like the audience to know? I've spoken a lot, so I'll, I'll keep it really brief. I just thank you again for, for organizing and, um, and you know, th thanks to um, the collaborators on this. Um, I mean, to Rich, to, to California Giant, um, Good Farms, Gempack, um, Nature Ripe, and then for Annaberries as well for participating in this challenge with us. I mean, it's, it's so much more powerful when you know industry uh, works towards solutions to a challenge and so i think this is a great example um and one last thing is i have gotten pretty specific about where i think the the solutions lie um i don't you know there are folks in this in this audience i hope that have uh, identified solutions that may exist in other spaces and you know please expand our horizons on what's possible um you know we're stuck we're we're really we're really looking for a solution here and it might not lie where we think it lies. So um, 
thanks to, uh, I'd like, also like to thank uh, Alejandro Sanchez for, for helping, um, for working with Suiza and Danielle and putting this on. Um, she works for Driscoll's and, um, and to all the audience members here, thanks for sitting through this. And um, um, if there are questions that I didn't answer in the chat, from the chat, um, I think there's a way to route those questions to me via email. So uh, thanks will, again. We will do so. And uh, we will also put up the recording on our website uh, on, the, on the Ag Plastics Innovation Challenge page, as well as it will be on the WasteWise page. So look at that. And um, uh, Rich, uh, you with final word to the innovators? Yeah, you know, I, like James, I thank everybody. Um, and you know what, the innovators, you guys, you know, hopefully find something that, you know, we as growers can kind of move forward on this one because at some point there has to be an answer. But, you know, I, I hope it's sooner than later. Uh, the landfills are getting full and we have to take care of this issue you know, pretty quick. And you know what, I, I, I'm pretty sure some growers are telling me like, Rich, we're doing everything we can, but I think we as growers and farmers, we need to kind of do our due diligence to move forward on this one. You know, and we're just, because we're filling it up pretty fast right now. And uh, we just gotta, we gotta find answers. And that's why like, you know, I'm all part of it. Cause you know, for me, I, I live it. I just, I live it every day, so. And I see it every day, and I, I, I you know, like, I, there's, it's, we don't live in this perfect world, so hopefully one day we can at least take care of this part of this, this, uh, take care of this right here with the, with the mulch. You know, that's, that's a big thing for me right now, too. So, thank you, Rich. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. And uh, to all of you, you heard it. The time is now. Um, the growers want you. The uh, industry wants you. And we're here to help support your innovation. So enter the innovation challenge and remember the conversation has just begun. We're happy to be in touch with you. Uh, we're easy to find. And thank you again, uh, WasteWise for hosting this conversation and Driscoll, California Giant and Satsuma Farms for being a part of it. Thank you all. Thank you, Daniela. Right. Uh, thank you. Thank you, James, and thank you, Rich. Uh, just, uh, I mean, to the audience, I know a few of you have asked about the recording. You will have access to the recording uh, right after the webinar is done because you've registered for it already. Uh, it'll go up on our website next week. Please head to wastewise.be, you will find it. And I have dropped a link to the innovation challenge on chat. So please go and check out more about that. And like Daniela mentioned, every people are available online like you'll find email ids you'll find them on linkedin so you can connect with the panelists so thanks a lot have a good day all of you bye-bye thank you bye-bye thanks bye-bye thank you bye.